Thanks for stopping by Big Top Gaming. My name's Brian. And I'm Ethan. And today we have a Brawl Machine battle report between Scorn and Minions Trolls, kind of, but not really, because Ethan doesn't play Trolls. Nope, I play Trinions at worst. Yeah, Trinions is the one I was thinking of. And then I thought of Moles for a little bit, but that just sounds weird. Trinions is better. Trinions is better. So this week I showed up and I was like, you know what? I want to play Helga 1 in Vengeance of Dunia and just throw that down. Because I think that theme opens up some options for her and actually gives her some good infantry and actually good beasts with reach. Uh, so like I said, I'm in Vengeance of Dunia. My battle group is a Warhog and a Brawler for a reach heavy. Dunian Archon is a rec option. One River Raider. Min Stone with the Northkin Elder because I have a min unit of champions with Scotty. That way I can use the plus one speed aura on the brawler and the champs, or I can give the champs plus two damage. And then my sideboard is a champ hero, unit of Valkyries, and a gobber crew, but like with the points working out with the champions and the stone unit, it's really hard to sideboard stuff. And would like basically drastically change the list, so I don't really know how much I'm gonna utilize the sideboard. It just kind of exists. I think that's kind of how it works like in Trolls in general too is that when you get into the sideboard options you're really like kind of hindered because you're typically taking a lot of melee option or not melee options but you're taking a lot of support in your main list and as soon as you start deconstructing that it makes the list really weird. Yeah like if maybe if I could swap out like which UA on the stone or like go from a min to a max stone or a min to a max on like the champ units I think the sideboard would open up a lot more. Yeah. But that's just a brawl thing in general. For Scorn today, I decided to go back into our uh, viewer requests that I kind of had a while ago. And uh, one of them that came up that I was interested in was this Makeda 3 list. Like, I think uh, I've always tried to play Scorn a lot in the past, and it just never really stuck to my ribs, kind of like how Protector it did. So now I'm going to try and lean into them a little bit more. And someone gave me a list to play with with Makeda 3. Uh, the bat the main list is her with Molot Karn and Archidon, a Bone Swarm, and a Terrorizer. And then the uh, rest of the list is just a Pain Giver Blood Runner that's going to be a Taskmaster today. And then a Boil Master and a min unit of beast handlers. The sideboard is a Kraya with a Feral Geist, a Mortithurge Willbreaker, and then a unit of Swamp Gobber Bellows Cruise. So the reason why I wanted to pull onto this list is that someone in response to this list being posted had questioned if the Boil Master package was worth it just to be giving the Bone Swarm things and have the uh, Puppet Master going on. And uh, I thought when I first looked at the list that, yeah, I think it's probably valuable. So I wanted to kind of put that to it to the test. So not only do we have a viewer request, but we're kind of answering like a viewer question that came up too. So it's like a two for one deal. So I won the roll to go first and I did not want Makeda going first because of how she out threatens my list with rush and she has a hit and a damage buff with insight and she can kind of chew through infantry and you can see where I cutely put my trenches just basically to give myself a fort on the flag against all zero of your guns yeah it's uh, i mean though the terrorizer has his little pew pew non-spray he, he has the slug gun man you need to make sure that you're getting defended from that uh that that range four pistol yeah uh so helga went up she put two into the stone and put dash up put defender's ward on the champ unit and then walked for the stone walked six thanks to dash awakened the stone only rolled one so Two of the champs weren't in range. That's why they didn't run like all the way up there where Scotty is. And my battle group's just kind of following up. The plan is to lead with the champs with D Ward and yep, with D Ward and defensive line. They're def 16 in melee and they're armed 20 with the stone. So it's going to try and leverage them to deliver Helga and the battle group. And that's pretty much it for my turn. So turn one for me, uh, the first time I've ever played with Makeda 3 ever, um, I kind of just look over her spell list, and I've always thought Makeda was a very like technical caster or warlock, but when I thumbed through her cards, I was like, she's not really all that technical, she just has a deep toolkit that isn't really hard to use. So I'm like, all I really need to do here is get Bulwark out on turn one and dodge your threat ranges. So that's what I end up doing. I get Makeda out there right away, and I'm like, okay, well, if I charge, 
am I going to be in danger from anything uh, from Ethan's army? And the answer to that question is a resounding yes. So I, instead of charging, I'm trying to figure out a way to put her up to where um, I can get her and Mullet Karn going uh, together. So we've got Bulwark and then uh, a big nasty beast threatening the middle of the table. And uh, I think the I apparate the um, the Blood Runner ta- no the, it is a Taskmaster but uh, the Blood Runner something or other the Whip Chain apparition dude the solo that's uh, by the Circle Zone he ends up just apparating a little bit outside that building the g- deal with him is I'm just gonna try and harass the uh, the Swamp Gobber River Raider so I can kind of clear that zone out for myself um, the next thing I do is. Uh, run or walk up with uh makeda's battle group at least i'm fairly certain that i walked here and didn't yeah, you charge. walked and fate walker yeah that's right walk and fate walker so um then after that mullet karn runs up to make sure she's got bulwark and i think i said based on the way that i remember this game because uh, this was prior to the holidays and then we had to take a break to finish filming it so there's going to be a little bit of a gap here and there but uh i think i said it's okay if one champion gets a charge on me because that's all that's going to happen. So I think there might be that might be something that's working up there. Um, yeah, you put him within range of Scotty. It's hard to see with the building because you're like, well, with Bulwark, I'm deaf. 16. 16, so you need eights, and I can force you to reroll. So it's just like, well, good luck hitting. Like It's just throwing away Scotty for nothing, effectively. Yep. So she's she's got some pretty tanky stats to do some things. Uh, next up, I end up, uh, I think I also put Swarm on her for what it was worth, so she might even be higher than that. But the Arcanon moves into the circle zone to also deal with the River Raider, so we got lots of things to kind of keep this zone ours. And then I have the Bone Swarm up there. I rolled uh, corpses from the uh, Boiler Master onto it, so it's sitting pretty beefy right now, I think, with two corpse tokens. And then my uh, Beast Handlers get up ready to, uh, they're kind of fanned out across the whole battle group for next turn. So this turn, I go deep into the tank because, quite frankly, I'm not sure what to do. Like, Makeda is up there. Mullig Karn threatens 13 inches with Rush before sidesteps. And with Dash and the Stone, my champs only threaten 11. My Brawler only threatens 11. And, like, because of the way the terrain set up, I really got funneled into the middle because nothing of mine has Pathfinder. So, like, Helga is kind of stuck behind the champs. But I see this cute play where Helga can walk up behind the obstruction there because there is room, get within 10 of Molly Karn, and go for a cute muzzle play. And, like, it's been a whole addition since I've cast muzzle. Like, <laughs> that's how long it's been since I've played a muzzle caster. But if you damage a war beast with it, they can't advance towards the caster. So if I can get this off, needing a boosted 10 to hit, which would be a forced reroll because Molly Karn shenanigans then I can cyclone back into a weird spot and then I can get my heavies up. And now all of a sudden that top zone is mine because Mullicarn can't come to me. And there you see me miss. So yeah, it wasn't, you didn't need a boosted 10. You needed more than that because swarm is up too. So he's uh, 13 up to 16 up to 18 with swarm uh, swarm. You don't get swarm concealment though. Concealment for the caster. Oh, I thought it was anything within the living range, so. models within two get neg two to attack rolls, right. and the caster gets concealment. I can't remember my stats anymore. But. I've played bone swarms like tremendously with like Maylock and Rass, so I got that shit memorized. So with the muzzle plan failing, there's not really a whole lot I can do this turn. Like I can run deep or deep wide with the brawler to stay out of Mullicarn's threat, and then try and maybe clear the left zone next turn. So I opt to move up kind of defensively, like champs are barely moving, just to try and make him come to me, and then maybe I'll be able to clean up with my battle group the next turn. But like his uh, stat cracking kind of goes through D-Ward and D-Line. Like with all the buffs, I think you need sixes to hit, and yeah. then your dice minus two. And I'm naturally a high mat anyways, so like my legitimately my my one spell negates that that buff for you so i'm in a pretty good spot to deal with those champions yep and there you see me measuring mullet karn's casual 13 inch threat so it's like i can run the brawler to that deep corner and i threaten the entire zone so if mullet karn comes into the zone 
I can at least threaten him. So, but I'm like, my brawler is playing so wide and that's not what I want him to do, but that's kind of where Mullikarn has pushed me. And then River Raider just contests. So coming around to me, this is kind of one, at least in my opinion, it's a really good place to be going into the bottom of two with uh, someone playing a little more coy on things. And it's not to say that Ethan's doing anything wrong. It's just that my battle group threatens so far and Makeda herself is so dangerous that he can't afford to play fast and loose. He either has to, he has to pick one of two things, deliver the entire brick and hope it survives or play coy like this and then wait for me to kind of get my things up further and see what happens. So I opt to uh, apparate with the Blood Runner and charge into the River Raider. Uh, I'm a whopping mat eight, so that it's a kind of a coin flippy situation to hit this goober. And uh, maybe I just run to contest to. No, you jam missed. Him up. You oh, missed. I missed. Sorry. So I must have missed my dice roll too. I'm just missing all over in, all over here. So. Uh, I'm trying to figure out exactly how I want to make this happen because I can't get rid of the brawler from that zone because he's barely towing it. And if I decide to unpack Mullet Karn all the way over there, uh, I don't feel like I'm doing myself any favors by just kind of throwing him off into the distance. At least that's what Brian thinks right now. We'll see what Brian thinks in uh, like a minute here. So my big thing is I want to try and start working on some of these champions because they are pretty dangerous and they hit accurately. They hit hard. And uh, they're also kind of a pain in the butt to deal with. Um, there's a lot of shenanigans that they have with uh, Bond of Brothers, I think, is the ability that they have. I, th I think it's called two different things. And for them, I want to say it's still Bond of Brothers, though. Sanguine Bond. Sanguine Bond. Okay, so there's Sanguine Bond, and then there's Bond of Brothers. You get Bond of Brothers when you're a shitty Kador attachment. That's a mini feat. <laughs> yeah, a mini feat. <laughs> so... Um, the Sanguine Bond kind of messes with some of the things that Makeda wants to do on Feet Turn, and I'm not 100% sure if I want this to be Feet Turn for her. I can unpack into Champions and try and do a bunch of work to kind of take them down. So uh, I opt to have, I think, the Terrorizer go up, and maybe he took a shot at one of them, and that's why we're getting some damage on there. I figure I can put the Terrorizer in the zone, and that means that the Brawler, if it wants to do something, it has to come into this zone and, and take care of the Terrorizer. So I'm giving away a little beast, uh, even though he's a really good beast, for your heavy. Isn't and he also a free beast? He's a free beast. A freebie. Ugh, a freebie. I hate free lights. Yep, I know. It's rough, especially when they're that good. Like... I feel like that's one of the biggest things about Scorn in Disciples is just getting free lights that are really good. So um, I opt to get a little spicy with the way things are in here. So I, bul I have a, a bulwark target with my Terrorizer in the back with one of the uh, Exalted Court or whatever they're called, Escorts. Um, then Makeda ends up going off into the middle of the table. I have a feet up, so I'm going to try and do a ton of work to champions here. And uh, we're, I believe we're swinging into Scaldi right now with her. And then she's got her little buddy that's with her too. Uh, I don't think I got a charge. I was just kind of positioning her in a way to kind of just be somewhere and not so much trying to um, really affect any of your models. So I start going into champions, and I think I spread around something like 6 damage, 10 damage, something like that. Yeah, I do need the charge, and you put up Grievous Wounds instead yeah. of buying extra attacks. So yeah. like... You were hoping once it comes down to the wire, you would be able to get the extra focus from her fury from failed tough checks. I also, for whatever reason, when I cast Grievous Wounds, had had it somehow in my head that that stopped Sanguine Bond, but it doesn't. So it does not. So I was, it was just kind of a mistake on my part for playing a caster for the first time. But I still have Mullet Karn up here, and uh, he ends up getting into champions, and I think this is where you're kind of figuring out how you want to shuffle this around, because I did crack you pretty hard with that charge. I mean, he's only a POW 18 Weapon Master on the charge with yeah. Rage and Insight. Yeah, nothing fancy. You know, just a Mat 10 POW 18 Weapon Master, no Casual, base. casual war beast. Yeah. So uh, I get the extra swing in, and so, or I get that. You get your damage settled out, and then I sidestep over. My goal here is to kind of pull around to these other champions that are in the zone too, because I think it's getting to the point where Ethan's going to start running out of uh, dudes to kind of throw wounds on, and you can see now he's starting to just take his tough checks, which you can't take because I, I can tough them. 
off Sanguine Bond, but the ones you oh, tapped... Oh, yeah, that's right, because I don't. That is why I shunted damage away to try and tough, yep, but so I failed it. This is just the, the reminder of how I was not smart with this again. So uh, we end up uh, taking out... <laughs> I know Mullet, it's so sad watching Mullet Karn kind of bend over here. My Scorn army has seen better days. Like, I did not get it in the greatest condition in the universe, so Mullet Karn's probably going to be taking a digger for the rest of the game. He just really likes the dirt. So um, I end up taking out uh, three champions total, and that gives me enough to uh, uh, sidestep or fate walker back into uh, Makeda so that we can get Bulwark up. I'm playing a little fast and loose with her here. Um, I didn't get any Fury off of that for the feat, but I think I might have left a Fury or two on her for transfers. And then outside of that, it's just Operation clear the zone here to get some points and make sure that I make it as difficult for Ethan to try and kill Makeda as I possibly can. So the Archidon goes over here and munches that final troll champion, and then he lightning strikes to get in Makeda's way too. So if Ethan wants to get that Warhog onto me, he's got to go through the uh, Archidon and Mullet Karn to get there. You might be able to get there with, without um, without going through Mullet Karn, but the big thing was the Archidon wants to body block for Mullet Karn. <laughs> So going into my turn, like I've lost all my champs, my heavy is way out of position, and there's my Cadus and two heavy staring down Helga. Like I gotta do work, but all of his stuff is really high stats. So even with Field Marshal Gangfighter, my Warhog goes up to mat eight, and he needs what to hit an Arcanon? Because an Arcanon under Bulwark base, is base fourteen up to seventeen. Yep. So I need a nine even with gang fighter. So like, I don't think I can kill his battle group. So now here I am just speaking about, can I kill Makeda? Cause the whole shtick of Helga one is her feet does interesting angles and the river Raider survived. So I'm wondering too, like, can he walk stay max reach on the blood runner, maybe shoot his gun over, but that's going to be way out. So now Helga's measuring, uh, can I like? Can I get the Dunian Archon to run to engage Makeda? That way, it procs gain fighter for Helga, and then can Helga, through the power of Cyclone and charging, reach around past the heavies and slam Makeda to my brawler? Like that is the game plan, and this is a lot of like measuring and me being like, I fucking hate Makeda. <laughs> Because <laughs> uh, I'm like, oh, I I wanted to play Helga one and have some fun. And you're like, you know what? I'm playing Makeda three, and I was like, well, this is gonna go great. Uh, so now it's just literally trying to line it up and try and improve my odds as much as I can because Helga has to Cyclone to get into position. She has to dash Cyclone again. That's what we're trying to figure out. Does she need dash? But she does. So that's gonna be two, two. I can boost the cyclone to hit and then buy and boost if i miss the first one so i go up to mat eight with gang fighter and what is makeda's defensive stats under bulwark i think she's base 15 so goes up to 18 if i recall yeah base 15 up to 18 so i just need a casual boosted 10 and it turns out that the dunian can't really reach there so what i do is the Dunian charges an Arcanon, misses, and now the Warhog is going up and he's just trying to power through. And you can see that roll was really bad. Like, if I can hit, I do decent damage because I did the Roid Rage thing. So with Gang Fighter and that, I'm POW 20. So I believe I'm like dice plus four on an Arcanon. Yep. So the Arcanon goes down easy peasy, and I think uh, Makeda ends up taking the Fury from him because he had like two. Uh, yes, but the terrorizer is full. The the bone swarm is the only thing I've got as a transfer target right now. Yes, and like now here's where we're gonna try and line up Helga. So now like I couldn't prog gang fighter, so now I need a boosted twelve because I'm only mat six. So there it goes. I believe I had to cyclone around my roadhog. Er, Your warhog. My yeah. warhog. And then there where I'm just trying to be like, okay, is he in control? Can I slam that way? So, like, if I slam her, 
It will probably get her out of control of the bone swarm, but I miss. I think you actually must have hit that somehow, and then I used Mullet Karn to make you re-roll. No, Mullet can only oh, re-roll himself. Sorry, we're, it was something different. So I missed the attack on her. I bought and boosted. I missed. I missed. Or I hit Mullet Karn at first. That's the one. You that forced I me to re-roll, so I couldn't slam him out of melee range, and then I pretty much concede because I'm sitting naked in front of Makeda and Mullet Karn. Yep. So for for showmanship, I think we. We uh, started just rolling it out, and I'm like, "Well, Makeda's gonna just uh, just sit here and punch you because I don't need I don't need insight to get Helga when she's no camp." So uh, we just go through the the motions here and start swinging for the fences. Maybe I did put up insight just for for funsies. I'm not sure exactly, but the, with those dice rolls, like Helga's not long for this world, so we end up uh, forcing tough on her. She takes a digger, and then I take turn one. So going into the second game, there's not much I can even sideboard just because my battle group works up, and I just got to try and leverage the feet better and hope I roll high and actually hit Makeda through Bulwark to try and kill her. That's pretty much my game plan and hope. Living on a prayer when you're playing Helga. Yeah, and when you've got turn one, it's not so bad. So for my list, I didn't change anything either. Um, I think the list is working fine the way that it's supposed to. Uh I also don't feel like I have um, my bearings with the list quite yet because it's really just like so far I've only been able to do like play my play my buff and kill things with my melee caster. There hasn't been a whole lot of shenanigans that I've been pulling out or, or a bunch of scenario play. So I'm just kind of rolling with this again and seeing how it turns out for the second game. So Brian stuck me on the same side again. Uh, because like you said since I lost and like I really 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 do not want Makeda running turn one and then basically her army's in the zone and it's like well leave your deployment zone and you're in threat so this is going to be really really familiar to last turn except this time I walk the stone so if he rolls a one again on awaken I will catch all the champs which he does or no, this time I think you rolled a two. Yeah, you got it. Awaken is a is a is a funky spell when you've got things to put out. I mean, like the, the for trolls they love it because they don't have a whole lot of buffs to put out from casters. But for Helga, probably is a little different. And now I decided to keep my brawler central, <clears throat> just to try and be like, last game I went in with like maybe I can pull out scenario, and now it's like scenario's dead to me. It's just try and push up the middle and reach Makeda somehow. And like so my brick is going forward and I even got the river raider in the middle. So right away the thing that I notice is the way that de that Ethan deployed this turn means that he's kind of uh, shutting himself out of that square zone on the top of the screen. So I feel like there's some ways that I can uh, fix the scenario play so that I can try and uh, instead of just like doing whatever and and trying to kill stuff this way i can try and uh try and leverage that i think there was maybe a little bit of reshuffling around with the boiler master because this is also another thing that i haven't played before really so uh i didn't realize that he needed to actually carry the pot with him to make it move faster so i just kind of shuffled deployment a little bit yeah and like from where i was sitting i couldn't see it through the building i know that building's uh building is it's a lovely looking building but it's always always ends up in places where it's not super great for the game it, in terms of looking at it from this angle so the archidon and the uh bone swarm who got two corpses from the boiler master i'm feeling pretty good about that uh they run up to be bulwark buddies in that circle zone and the uh apparition fella the blood runner is going to be mostly hanging around the flag because i had noticed that mckay like i couldn't score flag point or get points on that flag because Makeda wants to be up so far forward and i don't really have any solos to take advantage of it otherwise so i'm deciding to keep him back behind the building so that i can kind of pu pull that out of my pocket later the Beastmasters kind of line up like they did the first time, and mostly the way I unpack is really similar to the way I did it before. The Terrorizer is just in a little bit better of a spot now because he's not so threatened by anything on Ethan's side. Yeah, in last game I noticed, like, Brian, his Beast Handlers are spread out through the whole map, so I'm not super worried about the Circle Zone collapsing. That's why I'm just trying to push up 
and then maybe branch out into the square, but like this is again the turn of positioning. Like his stuff out threatens me, it hits harder, and like he can kind of turn off like my tough or just basically turn off defender's ward with Makeda. So it's a game again of trying to basically use the champs as fodder and hope enough of the like at least one or two survive and then maybe engineer some stuff so uh, i want the river raider to do stuff but like he's leveraging like his assassination potential with real and dual attack is so hard when he's only mat rat five and there's only one of them like i guess it's 75 it's not as bad because you're like oh i got three or four of them one of them will hit but in brawl only having one is kind of like he's not going to do much, and it's all like banking on one big die roll. Yeah, I think the River Raider plus Helga combo doesn't translate well to Brawl Machine just because people are usually chasing better stats, so it's harder for him to do work. And like you had said, the reason why River Raiders are good at 75 is because you get so many chances to throw that, and it's really hard to escape their threat. Yep. Uh, so I just pretty much put him up in the zone. So I know Terrorizer is probably going to kill him, but... Then it's something Terrorizer's attacking and coming up to kill instead, yeah, instead of collapsing of to the middle or casting Rush. So it's basically a game of, like, I put a champ up. He's in that top zone. I'm trying to stay out of Arcadon threat and basically say, can Mullikarn and Makeda collapse this central zone, central middle part alone? So you can see, like, I've pretty much abandoned the circle because he would have to run his Beast Handlers or even kill a couple of them himself to get that middle or get the circle zone because the pot does not score it unless you kill your own pot. And then, like, I'm just bricking up in the middle as brickiest as I can. So, coming around to me, I'm still super happy with seeing the table the way it looks right now. I still feel like going for a really hard scenario play is kind of still within my grasp, even though. My beast handlers are kind of conged out and not going to be able to score that circle zone so easy. But I feel like maybe I can uh, tinker with that a little bit as the game goes on. So uh, with having the champion, there's only one single champion that's in that zone right now, in that box zone. So my goal slash hopes are to have the terrorizer go up and uh, wreck havoc on the... Uh, river raider that's in the zone as long as i get in the trench it means my slug gun's not going to be uh in a real bad spot to hit him because i don't believe you I, i'm pretty sure you don't claim cover when i'm in cover with you no if you're in the trench with me you don't get cover yep and i could have just aimed and used the scatter gun but i think that i was worried about that so instead of doing any of that i decided we're just going to charge with the terrorizer because then i get all my attacks anyways so uh he ends up uh eating his Wheaties that morning and just going in for it and ripping him off the table. Um, for whatever reason, I must have pulled him back a little bit. You sidestep. Oh, he's side. Yeah, because he's got sidestep. I'm sorry. I forget that the Terrorizer is more than just a rush bot and that it actually does stuff too. Yeah, he has the Riot Quest syndrome of like he has a whole shit ton of rules and he does stuff. Yeah, it's just a, a really good looking... It, good looking rules wise piece and actually after i like got to look at the model it's not as ugly as i thought it was when i first it's still a teenage mutant ninja turtle like. it is like it's a it's an it's an it's a love story to teen teenage mutant ninja turtles for sure so i'm That's surprised he actually it. doesn't have like nunchucks and a sai and and uh a bow because mm. he does have a sword um so next up we decided to uh, unpack Molek Karn because I don't want to get Makeda into this business yet because that's still a lot of your brick there and uh, I don't think I can get him into positions where I can break the brick and make it so that Makeda still feels real safe but I feel like I can put Molek Karn up in the business here and start doing work on champions and I think over here what we're doing is trying to figure out a, that the the base on that rock I know like it, it doesn't look like you would be getting the cover from it but since we p play with the base of the whole rock as the as the obstruction and the little slope is just the the decorative part of it um that back champion was claiming cover where i was wanting to put mullet karn so i had to kind of jut him out a little bit more forward uh so that i could not have the the bad hit rolls so i end up connecting with that champion i don't do much but sidestep I, back i do need it Oh, sorry. So you do Nian and I sidestep. Like I'm, I'm not going to not do Nian the PS18 Weapon Master yeah, Charge. Yeah, yeah. I um, I keep. I think I as much as I like. 
I've played against the Dunian so many times and utilized it myself so many times that I always forget about the little shunt the damage thing. It never fails. So um, my plan to try and get that champion and then get back into the zone and out of the threat of the Warhog just didn't work out the way I wanted it to. So I end up doing a bunch of damage to champions and then sidestep into the zone. And now I'm just going to be buying attacks on that one champion because I just really want to get that one out of the zone so I can score a point over here where Ethan's going to have to actually pay attention to scenario instead of just kind of ignoring it because he's just going for Makeda. So Mullet Karn gets the one champion out and some of the other champions are hurting but I still believe you have three left over so uh, I didn't really get to do as much work to them as I wanted to. Next up the Arcadon runs over because again I want to try and keep Mullet Karn safe and this keeps the Warhog off of that circle zone and keeps the rest of your brick going that way so I don't have to worry about trying to uh, manage anything coming into this zone that much. My Bone Swarm takes a really defensive position and I pass turn. The Arcadon running to get base to base with Molly Karn wasn't something I was expecting. I thought he'd stay on the bottom to try and like hug the zone, but now like his his heavies are base to base, so they both get bulwark, so like there's not much room to like slam them away. Like I would have to basically get behind the Arcadon to slam it forward and like I'm trying to measure out like if there's a couple angles where like can this uh, stone bearer a grunt charge the terrorizer and maybe slam him out of the zone with feet can i slam the archadon like backwards into the rock at an angle that would get him out of base to base and then i end up just getting the stone going yeah i think you were able to get one charge off on the terrorizer or did you just run to jam here i believe i might have gotten a charge off but like the way my list was so gummed up he activated first Gotcha, yeah. And before I could feat, because I ran them around to proc Gang Fighter. Like, yep. one of the stone guys ran around the rocks, and now he's engaging Molly Karn. So now, if I get my heavies around the Arcadon, I have Gang Fighter, and I don't have to worry about it. And now it's just kind of measuring out, like, where can my heavies walk, and what can my champs do? Because there's, like, a little bit of a gap there where they can walk through... And it's like, do I feet? Because I'm trying to figure out, like, if the champs walk through the gap, can they slam through, reliably hit? Because that's the problem. Without boosts, it's not likely they're going to hit. And if they don't hit, then I don't slam, and I don't slam them out of base to base. So that makes it harder for my battle group. So it's like, should I just go with my battle group first to try and kill the Archadon? But I'd really, really like to get both of the heavies this turn because, like, Brian's given me the opportunity to. So the champs are pretty much going. Yeah, I think they were just taking swings at the Arcadon to try and ch chip some damage into it. Or no, this was Helga. Helga feeded and oh. she swung over the champs to punch the Arcadon to inflict pain. And I slammed it into Mullet Karn, but they're not knocked down because of Bulwark. But it got me the additional die damage. Mm -hmm. And then I Cyclone away just in case this fails. And now here you see champs moving around. Like I'm trying to keep gang fighter up and i'm trying to keep that one in the back i'm hoping i can maybe kill the archadon and then i can slam mullet karn you can see the nice line there of like if this archadon is dead warhog is going straight to mullet karn but then like i run into some issues i realize like okay if that farthest one punches mullet karn if i slam him any distance I'm no longer going to like be able to reach him with my heavy. So like that's the problem with uh, Helga's feet if you're trying to slam forward. Because then it's like, well, if I slam you forward, you're going to be out of my melee threat. And then like you just live. So there I slam him backwards into the rock. There was like a little bit of wiggle room where like he wasn't basing the obstruction. So now he's not basing Mully Karn. And I slam him into the rock. I'm a weapon master and leaves him on four boxes. But he is not knocked down because of Serpentine. Yep. So he's still got a pretty pretty decent defense stat. Even though champs are hitting him on sevens, it's still uh, not where you want to be. Yep. So I'm just kind of going through, doing my attacks. And then I kind of seal him off. And then, like, there's my gap, but... 
I was trying to still figure out, like, I tried to take an attack on Mullikarn, and uh, I believe I hit, and I was like, I can't slam him, because then, like, that just screws me over completely. And that's where I was, like, looking at the angles, so I'm like, okay, do I need the Brawler to go in with Reach to get there, or do I want the Warhog? I'm like, which one has a better chance of hitting Mullikarn? I think those might have just been the last few champion attacks. I think so. I end up going with the Warhog because I want the Mauler as a second, or the Brawler as a second wave reach heavy because he threatens farther. So the Roadhog with Aggression Dial and Gang Fighter hits at POW 20. So even, I believe he did force me to reroll, I think, one of the attacks because of how you... It was uh, it was uh, convenient because of the fury because uh, you inflicted pain on the Archidon and then when you killed it I decided to not reeve and then I needed to get another fury on Mullet Karn to make sure I was topped off and uh, um, I did that by getting the uh, the the reroll mm -hmm. and then Dunian just kind of runs up to reach everybody. So I'm not in the greatest of positions right now. Like, Mullet Karn's gone. My Archidon is gone. And it wasn't that it wasn't expected. I was just kind of really hoping that Bulwark would have kept me going. And I didn't realize that there was a slam vector that would get the Archidon out of base contact with Mullet Karn. So uh, now I've got to try and go for some... I can't really attrition right now either, so that's the kind of the issue that I'm that I'm in right now is that my bone swarm, who could be doing some work, isn't really in the position to do that because I put him behind the building to take a more defensive place when I really should have maybe put him up a little more aggressively because then the then maybe it would have forced Ethan to do things differently in the middle with the battle group and send the Roadhog off to kill the bone swarm instead of sending it at Mullet Karn and then the brawler would go into Mullet Karn, but now um. I at least still have the bottom zone to myself. I don't need to do anything to keep that. So it means that the Bone Swarm, with his wonderful Amphibious rule, because for the first time in my entire life, Amphibious actually meant something, because if he didn't have that, I couldn't go through this stupid pool of water to get to contesting that flag. So um, we end up... Do they have Pathfinder and... Yeah. God damn it. <laughs> so anyways... Uh, I'm contesting his flag now. I'm scoring the circle zone. I scored the flag last turn, and uh, the turn before, yeah, I scored the tur scored the flag last turn and on Ethan's turn since he didn't contest it. So Ethan currently is sitting at two points, and I'm sitting at three. So I feel like there's maybe a chance I could end this game right now as long as I get up to uh, six. Right? That's yes. the brawl machine win so uh, contest the flag score the flag score the circle zone all i need to do is get i think there's one champion in the square zone and one there's stone bear in the square zone with with the the warhog just getting his tippy toe in it yep so there's there's four models in the zone two stone guys the one engaging the terrorizer and the one by the rock one champion and a war yep so the, the terrorizer i feel like can handle this for right now so i'm gonna leave him for later i decide to go off on makeda this is my feet turn and i'm putting all of my attacks from my escorts into the uh or my exalted court whatever you want to call them I, they have a name i just don't recall it right off the top of my head so they take care of the uh the stone the stone scribe they take care of I think we do some work to champions, but you might be shunting damage off or dunian, dunianing it. I believe I'm shunting it off, and I'm saving the dunian for Makeda because she hits harder. Yeah, she does. So um, <clears throat> the damage gets shuffled around a little bit, and uh, my my goal here. I know I'm aiming really, really high for this one. Like this is definitely not the most reliable thing to be doing to put Makeda into a warhog and trying to kill champions on top of that. I was really hoping that the Exalted Court could try and do more damage to the champions than what they actually did, but it just didn't quite get there. And I think uh, I'm pretty sure that I might have missed doing Puppet Master with the pot on this turn too, so that kind of already puts me in the down downside. So uh, you've got your, your tough checks and your shuffling damage around um, because McCade is going into champions now. So... Uh, we start throwing damage dice, and I think that we're doing okay for damage, but just not as much as I really want to. So um, 
we're just uh i think i might have been balancing out fury because i might have not counted it out because i was really deep into this one you're trying you're boosting damage too because you're trying to overload sanguine bond because yeah. like we talked about it if he does the exact amount i will just allocate the damage uh to like use sanguine bond to cycle it around and allocate the damage myself to the guy in front and if i kill it with sanguine bond she does not get to overtake yeah so then she does not get to the warhog but you were able to just blow up the damage and like i couldn't shunt it so i had the tough and you got the kill yep so now we're into the roadhog and i don't have the biggest stack of fury in the universe over here but i'm still throwing some decent <laughs> dice you saw some some pretty high rolls there on the warhog um so now it's just really hoping that I can get some work done on this thing. And the, that damage roll was not super thick. So Makeda's now sitting here. I think your Warhog is um, on 10 boxes, something like that. He's on like five when I saw the grid there. Like it's low. Yeah, it's you not, not super great. So this is where I have to get really creative. And now the Terrorizer walks out of melee because he has parry. My hope slash goal here is that I can... Uh, spray the uh the stone scribe which i miss and then the next hope was to boost a gunshot into uh um into the the, the warhog because the pow 14 slug gun should do a decent amount of work to it and i i think the big goal for the the big hope on this one was to kill that stone scribe and shrink the aura but i didn't hit him either yeah, if your spray had hit killed him, you just needed a boosted 11 for damage yep. to kill because I only had five boxes. And so now Makeda, opposite of last game, is sitting naked in front of me. So now, like, we're going to go through and try and murder her. Uh, so basically, I believe she has, like, one or two. It might be one that I kept. Be she has one because I was trying to re I was trying to get her out of combat, but then I realized all my beasts were dead, so I don't have access to those anime. Yep. Oh yeah. Because uh, I walked up, I punched the bone swarm, and I gave him a fury, so now he's capped. So now I'm just having, and then I healed the warhog because she did not put up grievous wounds because she needed the fury, and uh, I boost a headbutt and miss. Because she still has good stats, so I buy an attack. I hit. And then I, I aggression dial because the damage is at the end this time, and I leave her on three. And then the brawler, or the Dunian, charges in. I don't know what I was rolling. Maybe I had like a, some kind of defensive thing going on. I'm not sure. No, the Dunian, I believe, hit you, and then the charge just murdered you. Uh, it was actually the brawler. They're both blue, yeah. so from this angle they look alike. But the brawl, the Dunian, is still tucked behind there. So even though I missed the boosted headbutt, brawler came in and just on the charge with gang fighter put her down. Yep, and I think there. I was just saying, can I? Act, would I have been able to charge off with the blood runner and then repo back to the flag with lightning strike? And I, I couldn't do it. So it was like I tried to go into the last like, what if I did this? But it just wouldn't work. Dice didn't show up. So for the final game, again, I'm not switching anything because my sideboard does not slot in well, and I did not want to like sub in Valkyries because they just go down faster than champs, and like I can't get rid of the stone because I need the stone, and like it was just not a good sideboard for this list. I think it, the list just has a hard time sideboarding because of what it's got. It's a very put together brick. For my sideboard, I decided to pull my head out of my ass and realize that the Blood Runner has really been just only a, a it has kind of changed its role into a flag scoring piece. So for taking four points out of the list, I get a Feral Geist and the Bellows Crew. So now my uh, supporting uh, beast handlers can go do what they need to do and not feel like they need to refocus into the zone later on like they did in the late game. I can just have swamp gobbers there to take a zone and not have to deal with anything and then i get a feral geist that not only can keep my beasts alive if ethan's scrapping at the bottom of the barrel uh but i also can just get a flag babysitter that's got uh hard to kill stats so with me uh losing last game i get to take the first turn this time around and you'll notice that makeda got a little bit of a glow up so it was there was like a two week pro uh, two week 
pause between this, between the holidays and all other sorts of weird stuff going on. So in that time period, I was like, man, this Scorn army looks so ugly. And then when Molik Karn was like, you know, flailing on the ground and died, I figured that was that was the, the, the signal, that was the sign that I needed to just get some colors on this army. So I started painting them and I think they look interesting even though they're not finished, but it's, it's cool. So uh, I end up... Uh, taking first turn and Ethan puts me on the side with the rock now which I'm not too worried about because like the rock still works for me with the Archidon there I can mitigate that quite a bit and the pool doesn't bother me because I have access to rush so I'm not too worried about those things either the bone swarm on the top side is going to go towards this square zone and the, uh, we end up getting two corpses on it so I'm pretty happy with the way that's been performing so far at least that little module and uh, Molek Karn is going to be running up the middle. Makeda's up on the flag. She was able to charge forward since I'm not really worried about any retaliation from Ethan this early on. And the Archidon went up pretty far too. The uh, Terrorizer gets up there in the pool because he's got Rush and can get himself out. The Feralgeist runs off as well as the Swamp Gobbers to do the things they need to do. And then uh, my Beast Handlers just take position to make sure that they can affect my War Beast in the way they need to next turn. So it's finally happened and Makeda's got first turn and now I have to walk up and respect her threat range is even bottom of one. So you can see the Archidon basically threatens past my flag. So I'm Helga just barely walks up, does the same things as before, D-Ward, D-Ward dash, and she's going to try and use the building as kind of like a cyclone bunker where she can kind of maybe cyclone around it and then flatten farther and then try... Because one of the hardest parts of this matchup is, like, Helga can't ever go forward or she dies. Like, pretty trivially. Like, if Makeda surfs to her, if Mullet Karn gets a couple sidesteps, like, she just goes down. So I'm trying to use the bunker as Fort uh, Helga this game. And then, again, just kind of same as before, going to be leading with the champs. I throw up a couple of them because I'm like, okay, if the Argonaut wants to come in, maybe I can uh, clear it up. But still, like... It's speed seven with sprints, so if it's at the max one inch, it can be basically eight inches away from what it just killed. So I have to put the brawler up deep, and I'm like, okay, can an Archidon kill a brawler? And under stone, and I was just like, I hope not. Yeah, it, it gets real, real dicey, but I, I'm a wild card. Yeah, like if you stack insight and beasts, like they go up to what, POW 17, 18? POW 19. So no batteries died, uh, just this seems to be a common issue with my camera right now where it seems to want the, it doesn't recognize the formatting of the SD card while I'm filming, so I'm going to try and figure out how I can deal with that because it's not, maybe it's just the card, maybe there's something in the camera that I need to do, but I'm not quite there in my understanding of AV equipment to fix that problem right now, so... Uh, unfortunately, I lost this turn, but it wasn't super exciting, except for how I've kind of faded a little bit onto the other side. So uh, what I ended up doing here was I, I spent a really long time trying to figure out, do I go into champions? Do I try to get up to POW 19 to deal with that brawler and be dice off one against it and then try and get the Arcanon out of there still? Um, so instead, I said, you know what, that Ethan's kind of bricked up really hard behind that building, and there's not a whole lot. Like, if he wants to break his brawler off the main group and go after that bone swarm, I think I'm okay with that. So I leave the bone swarm far off into the uh, other side of the zone. Makeda's still holding the center and keeping that bone swarm barely in control. And this way she's just staying on the flag, not getting really brave up front. And then the Archidon flies completely over to the other side of the table so that I can start dealing with the stone bearers and the Dunian and the river raider that are over there. Because that river raider could kind of go and start preying on some of my like support pieces that I brought in and when I say support I just mean the the swamp gobbers uh because maybe there can be some gobber on gobber crime or something going on here um mullet karn ends up going to that side too and sticking in the pool a couple uh beast handlers end up walking into base with him so he, they can get some work out of him the terrorizers in there as well i think i've kind of just really done this like bob and weave fake move and put everything that i have 
centered up in this circle zone. So anything that comes in the middle, I still can get to with the uh, Arcadon and Molokarn, and Makeda can still be really safe where she's at. And now Ethan's got to deal with this building in his way. So I feel like I'm in a pretty well, a pretty good position here to keep things going well for me next turn. Yeah, I was not expecting Arcadon to go wide. So, it, like Brian said, it has been a couple weeks since we played game two, and I see a potential mistake that Brian has made. No, oh, no. And that is, nothing is base to base with Molly Karn from the battle group. So, he does not have bulwark. Mm -hmm. So, he's not deaf a billion. So, here we pick up the building to see can Helga walk up to the building and keep the rear part of Molly Karn in my feet range? Because my plan is, if the River Raider walks up, shoots the Beast Handler, who is the same def as Molly Karn, but he can't force me to reroll it, I can reel into him and then punch Molly Karn in the back to slam him to my champion slash brawler. But that's an unboosted 8 to hit, and like that is what my game plan revolves around. <laughs> like, if I feet and miss, like in my mind, like I've just lost any assassination threat on Makeda and then she just runs the board but like if I don't do this my other plan is okay what if I go for a muzzle play again this time Molag Karn is not deaf 16 so Makeda only needs a boosted 7 but to get that far up she'd have to go to the other side of the flag and would be in Makeda threat so it's like I like go back and forth a lot. I can try and muzzle, and then I die to Makeda. I can feet behind the building and hope one River Raider can slam Molag Karn and save the day. I don't need dash, but I think like I'm just gonna cast it anyway, uh, in case the champs need the extra distance. In case I only slam him like one inch or two inches, because he is a little bit in the water in there. We're, that's where we're checking the line of sight around the building to see like. Can I be in this spot where I can feed on him and muzzle him? But because of the way, like the angle out the back end of the building, it's impossible. And basically, I'd have to be standing where the champs are. So I would need the champs to go first. And then I have nothing to kill Molikarn. So I would basically be like, I go up, champs move out of my way. I muzzle, hope this works. And then I hope they body block against Makeda. And I was like, that's a lot of hoping. And I was like, I don't see like another way to unpack into next turn because of how he's spaced and how far he threatens. So I decide to YOLO it and the stone goes, runs to get out of my way, pops aura. One contest the zone. I just kind of space them out so they can run in droves to contest. And now Helga is going to or I got to move the Warhog too, because like yeah, everything was so gummed up behind that building. So I keep the Warhog in threat just because I need him to come to me and then hopefully get him like away from Helga. So I go for the feet, move up, put a couple into the stone. I'm debating camping one or camping two. I decide to YOLO it and put two into the stone. After I measure like how far I need the aura, so I'm camping one, I feet, River Raider walks up, shoots his gun, and misses. Yeah, we don't even need the other die on that one. Nope, need an eight, rolled a one. Uh, so I'm like, well, that was a fun feet turn for Helga. Champs just walk up, and then Brawler runs. Like, that was on the clock, like, good ten minutes of planning just for one die roll to fail. And I was like, feels bad, man, but that's the game. So going into top of two for me now. Top of three? Top of three. Pretty sure it's top of three. It's top of three. Yep. I was uh, I lost track there for a minute. So Ethan's plan really, uh, I'm, it's good that it didn't work out for me. It's still unfortunate to not see the cool shenanigans happen with the River Raider since it's kind of like the 
the the the mythical theme of Helga and why she's like fun and good to play with, uh, not play out here. But in Brawl Machine, when you've only got that one chance and no access to a reroll on it, it really can hurt quite a bit. So uh, what I opt to do here is figure out how I'm going to kind of combat um, what Ethan's got going on here. So I think the way that I want to do this is uh, for sure I want to get rid of the Swamp Gobber that's in the middle because I feel like Mullet Karn's going to try and go and take out a Warhog and uh, and knock down a Stone Scribe because most of his his big brick is split now because of this building and that means that I can put Mullet Karn on the side with the Warhog and make sure that whatever is there's nothing back there that can kill him after that. Maybe Helga can get in with some cyclone business and try and deal with him from there, but that's a big investment and uh and there's a good chance that it might not happen because Mullet Karn does have like above average stats and still has access to that reroll. So if he doesn't need the entirety of his stack to kill that Warhog, then it's all good. So I decide to start this train of doom with Makeda. We charge up and feed. I'm able to get one of the exalted onto a champion, and the other one can't because it had to position a little bit further back. Uh, Makeda's in a, in a space where she's uh, two inches within, or she's within reach of a champion, but the champion doesn't have engagement to her. So if I have some fury left over to lightning strike or fate walker back, um, that'll keep me a little bit safer from Helga because that is something I need to worry about. Bulwark is still up, and uh, the Exalted ends up uh, doing enough work to uh, bring a champion down, I believe. I toughed. Oh, yeah, you toughed, and then Makeda ends up going in and starts swinging. I think now you're getting ready to uh, uh, shuffle damage around and throw some tough checks, maybe, because some of those were a little bit big on the... I do need Makeda's first one. Oh, yeah, yeah. I and then, I yeah, now I'm shunting it around. Yep, so we're just kind of going all in on just trying to destroy a bunch of champs here because I think Mullet Karn uh, should be able to get me two Fury back onto Makeda, and then that Swamp Gobber River Raider should go, so we'll be able to get at least three back. I think bare minimum I'm going to get three back on her. So uh, I feel a little bit more comfortable with spending my stack here, and uh, we do a little bit more damage. Her, her damage rolls aren't showing up super great, but they're a dice off three, so it's not terrible. We get a couple good spikes in there, and again, I decide to... Uh, I think there was a Puppet Master on Makeda for this one, so I did get to actually utilize that, and I think it was on the first damage roll, maybe. So here's where it got cute. Like, three of the champs are on one health. Scotty is on uh, four, and you did six damage. Yep. So uh, I Sanguine Bond assigned one, 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 and then three to Scotty to force tough checks on the three one health guys, and they fail, and because I killed it with Sanguine Bond, he doesn't get to overtake and he doesn't get Fury from his feet, and he can't cast Lightning Strike, and he doesn't have any other models in melee to punch, so Makeda's just sitting there with one Fury. Yep, which isn't the greatest spot for me. I wasn't expecting that to kind of go that way, but it is what it is. So the River Raider goes down to an aiming... Uh, um, terrorizer. terrorizer that's hidden by the Arcadon's wing right now. And uh, that gets McKay to one Fury, so I'm a little bit more comf comfortable with the way things are going there. Uh, we kind of, this is where I feel like, if I don't say this, I feel like I'll be even more skeezy. I had meant to boost the, the attack roll on that Gobber, or on that Swamp Gobber River Raider, and I didn't. I just rolled the four and got it. And then I was like, oh, wait, I needed to rush Mullet Karn. And Ethan was like, well, you didn't boost. And I was like, yeah, but I put the Fury down and said I was going to boost. So um, I don't think you realized with Insight and aiming, you only needed a four. Yeah. So, and you had two chances at it. So we did work it out to where I do just cast rush and didn't boost the roll since it played out that way. So Mullet Karn gets the rush. He has Enrage and Insight's up. So he's swinging pretty hard, hard on these guys. I end up... Uh, unfortunately, I take out the uh, the stone scribe any tufts right away, so I have to use my second initial to get rid of it because I want that fury back on Makeda. So I'm already down an attack into the road ho or warhog when I didn't think that that was the way it was going to go. Um, and then we're we're just uh, swinging for damage on this one. 
because the the first couple damage rolls didn't do super hot and then the final damage roll just blows him up to the box so i was really happy that this was able to happen and makeda was able to get another fury but it does mean that mullet karn's full up so there's not really anything else i can do over here what i kind of wanted to try and make happen was to maybe fate walker him up to kind of start threatening helga to force her off to the side or to engage the dunian or something but uh i did need my whole stack to make that happen the Archidon on this side of the table doesn't really have a job, so what he ends up doing is he runs up to be the Bulwark buddy and kind of body block for Makeda a little bit since I wasn't able to get her out of there. And uh, and that makes me feel pretty decent right now with her being uh, such a high defense and having that much fury on her right now. The Bone Swarm moves over a bit to try and make sure that he can stay within control for Makeda because he is one of my more... Uh, valuable transfer targets right now even though he's kind of sitting right across from a brawler so we end the turn and I score a couple extra points there because of the new pieces that I brought in yeah you score two to my nothing because you score your flag you're contesting my flag with a unit member and you score the circle zone yep uh, so I always forget her feet can add fury to herself from anything killing. So I was like, when Makeda got down to one or zero camp in front of me, I was like, oh, or one camp in front of me, I was like, oh boy, I can kill her. And then you started adding fury to her, and I was like, oh boy, I can't kill her. And she's staring in front of me because now, like, she's she's in brawler threat, but he's. His Archidon is base to base with the call, the court member in front of her, so he has no line to her until one of those two is dead. And he needs the one that's in the corner of the rectangle dead because she is in his charge lane. So I need to somehow kill those two members with all I have over there is Scotty, Scaldi, and Helga. And it's like she's camping four. Like, this is going to be really, really, really rough. And I, we do eventually pick up the building because, like, we're trying to measure where I can stand. Uh, because, like, I'm trying to go through all the situations in my head. I'm like, okay, if I have Scaldi punch this lady in the rectangle zone to clear away for Helga or clear away for the heavy, now the other ones are going to be plus two armor because of battle driven. And it's like, well, I'd like Helga to swing first because she can cyclone punch both of them at the same time so that way they wouldn't get uh the the plus two armor until after the attack is resolved so like hopefully like if i move up i cyclone i boost the hit the one that's in bulwark and then i just try to hit the four to hit the other one with that with gang fighter from scotty and then like boost damage on both of them and hope i kill but We'll see how that goes once we finally pick up the building because like in my head like at this point i have no other chance than to try and engineer and kill a bulwarked for camp makeda yeah because you're down a heavy on the bottom side of the screen and mullet karn's just kind of hanging around there just threatening all these things that really don't threaten him and the brawler's off kind of doing whatever it's not really like in the in a great position to start stopping anything that uh that mullet karn can do and it really isn't too difficult for the rest of my army or mullet or makeda to try and work on that brawler to make it harder for him to do what he needs to do either so you're kind of up against the wall here and you have to make some really tough decisions yeah nothing i've left can kill mullet karn like that's just a 100 percent given based on positioning so my plan is, like I said, get up there. I'm put. I'm measuring where Scaldi can go to not block line of sight for the brawler once the exalted court member that's base to base blocking the charge line of sight is dead. Because like if I have to charge the that person with the heavy, uh, then like I won't have an extra attack on her, and then like it's all gone. So I cyclone up. I boost the hit. I hit that lady. I miss the four on the non-bulwarked model, and now I have two Fury to play with. Uh, I did drop D Ward, and I believe I boosted the hit on the Archidon to try and like my. I had hoped if I had Fury left, I could buy in a couple attacks and maybe load him up, so that way he wouldn't be a transfer target. Because I think in my head I was thinking he's Fury three. He is Fury three, so I was like, if I tap him twice, he's not a transfer target. Uh, but 
when we go through and do it. So now, like, I've hit the bulwark one. I have to boost. I can't boost damage because I need to buy and boost to damage on the one that just got plus two armor. And I end up not killing. Or no, I do kill this one. Yep. So that does trigger battle driven at least. So that makes your your things a little bit more difficult than your future here. Yep. Because I buy, hit the unboosted for this time, boost damage, and then I do not kill. Yep. So now I have no charge lane to Makeda, and I just concede because I'm sitting naked again. Yep. That but that that uh, that exalted was left on two boxes, so battle driven kept them alive. Yep. Because so, I missed the unboosted four. Yep. So we ended up. Uh, like I said, we, we called the game because Makeda can just get Helga without too much effort here, and there's an Archidon in front of them too. Like, maybe the Brawler can come in and do some work, but uh, it, it's re- it's still really rough with him trying to hit a defense 17 Warbeast. So, uh, he has gang fighters, so like I should have played it out where I charged the Archidon, and then like if I have an attack left. But the problem is Makeda's camping four, and that's a full health bone swarm as yeah. a transfer target so like even if i take out bulwark like kill the archidon uh you're still def 15 to my mat eight so i still need sevens to hit and then with battle driven your armor 18 armor 20 armor because i think she's i think she's 15 15 18 no she's 15 16 so so i'm dice plus two and you have four transfers like unless i literally got every single attack into you there was no chance I could kill you. At best, I could kill the Archidon, and then I watched Makeda kill Helga. Yep. So that was uh, the the test run, I guess, for one of the viewer requests for this list. Um, I think there the question about the the Bone Swarm slash uh, Boiler Master package. I know that I didn't utilize them all that well this game, and I definitely ended up spending more of my time using the fury with Makeda to attack things than it was than I did uh getting swarm up. I feel like if we weren't dealing with the sanguine bond shenanigans, it would have been more likely that I would be putting swarm up on myself because I'd be getting that fury on Makeda and being able to spend it afterwards to do that. You did put up swarm game one when Helga failed to kill you. Like that is also one of the reasons why I needed astronomical numbers. Exa- I yeah, forgot you sw- yep. you were swarmed in bulwark so you were deaf twenty one in melee. Yep, so it was really And rough. it's just like whoa like yeah. i can roll dice and maybe hit you so i think for sure the bone swarm is worth it with makeda because you get a decent beast decent and uh and you get a good animus for what she's trying to do in the list which is just survive and then kill things afterwards the boil master is a lot of points for something that's just going to be dumping corpse tokens on that bone swarm when it may or may not actually do anything but uh i do think that that combined with puppet master and the spell the one spell that he's got he has bone shaker right is that he has a weird gallows a weird gallows okay so i think that in general i feel like the boil master is a good complement for this list and the swarm the bone swarm works in here i don't think it's a package that personally i would take out of this list anytime soon i'd feel like in all honesty this is like probably the makeda three list i mean there's like you can tweak it up it's just like if you're in this theme it's pretty hammered down because like free terrorizer you're taking mullicar you're taking an archidon and then you're taking beast handlers and then what's left like the feral geist and the gobbers are arguably like the best solo and best unit in brawl machine just because they are so fucking cheap and like i don't have a cheap like unit on my side that throw away like i need my stone unit i need my champ i can't have them all in a zone off on the corner doing nothing well in your stone it's it's got a very predefined or predetermined position right like it needs to stay in the back so you can keep the bubble and it needs to make sure that it's by all of your other stuff so the the stone in brawl machine almost really just kind of it, it definitely suffers from being a lot of points for support that doesn't get to really affect the game in a really positive way which is where i think maybe in the future as we like explore trolls and brawl machine a little bit more i think madrak 3 is going to have a lot of potential here because you don't need the stone with him so you can afford to have things like gobbers running off into the corner and then him just being a support thing because that's kind of what he does yeah so I think- and i mostly took it because Stacking the plus one speed from the stone and dash makes the champ speed seven. And that gives the list some threat extension where like Helga has dash, 
but like it's on speed five stuff so it's like i I still don't know threaten like champs threaten 11 inches that's it yep they they're they're not known well for their ability to get up the table quickly but with the stone and helga that changes i know at 75 points i think this helga list is going to be way way better but i think in order to double dip on the stat buffs between armor and speed it seems like that's your all-in play with uh with this list and makeda just had the tools to kind of ignore the rest of the things that you try to bring here to make your list work better yeah like this definitely in like in a pairing situation, like I would never drop Helga one into Makeda three and Brawl. Like Makeda, she's just so good. And Helga, like she's a fun caster, but she's a fun caster. Like at 75, like one of these days, I'm going to bust out my Helga one Vengeance of Duty and double War Wagon. Yeah. But no, like on feet turn, that's super fun. No, I, I, I'm, I've been playing a lot of double war. Well, playing in my head a lot of double war wagons lists lately like gunbjorn 2 has got me going crazy for those things it's just like helga one i wanted brawl like i thought she could excel in brawl because just like she does cyclone shenanigans and like feet can be cute it still just feels like she doesn't have enough tools at 25 to actually leverage the feet unless you're running like will work for food and you take a void archon and you take archons yeah but like any caster can do that better yeah well. exactly any 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 caster at all even if you were to just do this with maylock and archons you'd be like well i get a weapon master primal and then like i was like oh i can cast distraction and i was like wait that only works on units and it's only range 10 that's just like i've been playing lord Azalo, so it's like oh i have a range 15 distraction like yeah this is actually castable and then you go back to a caster that doesn't have an arc node and it's like guess this is a dead spell mm-hmm yeah it's it's tough business especially like the the one out you have is like bone grinders right but then you're taking more support for something you really don't need and bone grinders aren't in vengeance of dunia yeah that's right too but uh thanks for checking out this video i hope you enjoyed it we'll definitely try and get through more of some of these like requested list things but i think we'll the it'll be a little sticky on on how we get how we attack them at least just because Sometimes we come up with something cool we want to play with and we have ideas. So um, I'm going to try and get them on here so I don't completely ignore everyone who says, just try this or play this and it'll be cool. But this list was really fun to play and I think that it definitely, it it, it bends Brawl Machine quite a bit, if not breaks it just a little bit. It, it's fun for you. It's not fun for your opponent. No, it's one of those it. Brawl lists. Like, uh, it reminds me uh, of the Striker 2 game that we did against Agathon, or not Agathon, but uh, uh, Agatha. Animag. Animag, Jesus. There's too many Anna things. It's but- just uh, Makeda, like, she has a hit buff, a damage buff, a death buff. She murders infantry. She's and- got p- positioning shenanigans out of Eliminator, too. Like, I didn't cast it because I couldn't in the- against your list, but it's not something to ignore. Like, she can go through on feet turn, uh, kill a bunch of stuff, get her fury back, overtake to where she can't get anywhere anymore and then eliminate her out of nowhere to just start over again yeah like i thought like i know people are going to talk about mckay like is she too good for brawl i don't know like she's really really good and maybe like if i had brought also a similarly good caster it would have put up more of a fight but this was literally just like the Makeda slap fest where Makeda slaps around my lists. Yeah, it was it was always Makeda's game to lose. Like when I took that risky play with trying to kill the the road warhog, which I still don't think was all that risky because all I needed to do was like four more boxes and then I would have closed it out. But um, outside of that, I don't think there was many times where I felt like I was super threatened by anything. Yeah, there wasn't really a point where I was like, I'm in control of the game. It was me hoping your dice didn't work yep and that's not a like a great place to be but like again like i don't know if like maybe she's she is really good like if you had like in brawl machine say like every faction you had to pick one or two casters you're like okay this we're gonna ban this from brawl she would probably be scorn's ban absolutely like if you if you did the whole like take the top out then i think mckay to 100 would come off the list but like if the way they're doing the epic list and i know they it sounds like line of sight is very hesitant to expand the the list they don't want it to be like this long list of epic casters banned it's just we, I, we've had this discussion too it's just where do you draw the line of mm-hmm. okay this is really good or is this too good for brawl and that's a good discussion like i'm not saying like she needs to be banned because she touched me in a bad way and i hate her i already hated her not because of brawl just because i hate her I watched her chew through like 20 Tharn one game and I was like, this is fun. 
Yeah, she's she's pretty bonkers in just the game in general. So when you shrink the game down and still allow her to get every single tool that she wants outside of maybe a huge base here and there, like she's still just bonkers good. Yeah, it's she's just good. Like I don't know if she's ban worthy, but yeah, I mean, we'll have like, to see how season two goes because isn't season two coming up here or not season two? But yeah, I'm not sure if they're what the what the the gist is on those. I know they're doing their falling Corvus thing right now. And uh, I don't know how much more Brawl Machines getting tinkered with in terms of what the ban lists are looking like. But I think one of the things that, not to go on a tangent, which I know we're doing anyways, but like, I feel like uh, one of the complaints that a lot of people have for War Machine, which I feel like is kind of a non-existent, compl- or not a non-existent, it's kind of an unfounded complaint, is that the, the, the model range is too thick, that there's too much stuff out there. And uh, that's kind of, like I said, it, it, there's some truth to it a bit, but I don't feel like that's a problem for the 75-point games. But when you get into Brawl Machine where the, the range is that long for a game that's so different for War Machine, like War Machine just doesn't play the same at 25 as it does at 75. So when we look at something like Makeda or one of the other real uh, heavy hitters um, that I can't, I can't quite think of one right off the top of my head that's just like, why is this okay? I guess Striker 2 is a good example also, even though they're both very comparable. Like, those, they warp the game at 75, so when you take them into 25, they completely turn it on its head, I think. No, that's fair. Like, they don't lose anything going down in points, whereas, like, other casters have to make sacrifices. Mm -hmm. But, like, the list is basically them and friends. It's like it's kind of like why is it's why Butcher is banned because like the list would just devolve into does Butcher get to your caster exactly yeah and and these like people like Makeda or Striker they do the same thing it's just that they're not so notorious for it I think no they've been living in the shadows for a while because of just how the game has evolved yeah like Striker didn't see a lot of love again until Flames like but I remember playing in him like almost every other week in Mark Two and it's like the games were like. We play for an hour and a half of like, oh, we're playing a real game that's just like, well, you got within 17 inches of striker, scoop your caster up, I win. Yeah. And that's how a lot of my striker two games went in Mark two. And I was like, ugh. But now with when the, like pre-measuring came out, I'm not going to rant about it. We've done our striker two rant. Yep, we have. But I, I do think there's some definite changes that can be made to Brawl Machine to kind of limit the top end because there are definitely some that feel like they're so far out in front of the rest of the faction where like if you were if brawl machine were ever to have a competitive game state that it, you would boil it down to like mark two like m- the mark two prevalence of casters again where it's like in mark in at, towards the end of mark two it was not a very it was there was not a varied field of casters it was like i'm gonna play against scar i'm gonna play against denny i'm gonna play against gatsby too i'm gonna play against maybe well before body and soul had its problems you know i'm gonna play against denny too like you knew that if you were going into a faction that you needed to have you, know, you needed to have the tools to deal with like three casters because that's what you were gonna see like trolls literally had three casters available to them that you could play regularly that was more competitive and i feel like that's kind of where brawl machine could get but it would even get more diluted to where it's like one or two casters you're 100 percent gonna see from these factions if brawl machine went into competitive state and that's like we'll have to see how brawl machine shakes out once like in-person gaming goes because i know like they're doing all the leagues so they're, like they're getting data like a lot more data than us in our limited like armchair yeah going over stuff like we're like striker 2 is fucking terrible and they're like no it's probably okay because they get more games and they can see that data more so like sometimes it does feel like we're being knee jerky but like we've just had that experience with them and like we know what they do and it's like there is a range in brawl just like in 75 like it's new it's exciting so like people are trying out stuff so it's gonna be a little while before like i'm air quoting this a meta evolves yeah of like okay this is really good in brawl this is kind of mad this is okay like what's funzy what's really competitive just kind of like it's gonna hit that point eventually in my opinion because like you said, 25 doesn't play the same at 75. That's why there's a ban list. Mm-hmm. Because those things would be even more egregious at 25. It's just, where's the line? Where do you keep it fun and healthy? And like, I don't begrudge them at all for having to make those decisions. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm 
I think we've said it plenty of times that we're both very uh, happy that we're not the people who need to make those decisions. Um, but unfortunately, they are decisions that need to be made, I think, at some point in time. Because like you had said, you know, Wartable does provide a lot of data. But the thing about online play right now, and this I've seen this in a lot of different games or tabletop games that are going on right now, is that the Wartable meta isn't very fluid. It has a lot of the same uh, actors in it. Right. So like if you're a person who's open to online gaming, those same the people are just going to keep coming back and back and back to it. So if you look at something like to do an unfair comparison, Warhammer 40K, where people on Tabletop Simulator, there's more players of 40K. So you get more of a pool of online people who are okay with playing online. But in War Machine, there just isn't that many players that are interested in online play. Like maybe if you on, on a good day, what 400 players probably worldwide that are playing War Table online, that's not enough people to develop an entire meta. We're talking it takes thousands of players to develop and move a meta which kind of goes into another conversation which is just going to draw this video on longer about how cid more shapes the the in our mind meta right now because there's no natural meta to flow things because war table doesn't the war table meta doesn't evolve it just kind of like has the same players that stagnate the meta so it always feels like cid is the movement of the meta because there's no actual like there's not enough core data to keep moving the meta along I think we'll end the video there because that's probably going to just start another hour conversation. No, that would really definitely start another conversation about Sid shaping the meta. Like, we don't need that talk. Yeah. We probably already talked, what, an extra, like, 20, 30 minutes after probably. the game? We'll, we'll probably have to cut this off and make it another stupid podcast episode. Even though, like, the other one's not up yet? Like, we it's can't getting, keep pushing that down. It's getting there. You, like, in that video, it says, like, oh, podcast thing in the description. I went to look. I was like, oh, where, where is that? And it's, like, it's not here. I haven't finished it yet. It'll it'll be done soon. Don't worry. Along it's with this one, soon. Along with this one, maybe by the time this podcast version, podcast in quotes, comes out, we'll have a... We'll, we'll all be gaming on the table again. Who knows?